Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. The huge majority of human suffering is caused by aging. They are used as the icky bug way too often. We're designing this to have neighborhoods of researchers. Today on Spotlight, how to slow down the aging process and live longer. Plus, the Botanical Garden thinks they can make you fall in love with cockroaches. And then WashU breaks ground on their largest project in the history of the School of Medicine. But first, an art exhibit explores an archaeologist con artist. It's Sunday and you're watching the Emmy Award winning Spotlight. We are here in Craft Alliance's Steinberg Gallery and we are in the middle of our exhibition, Treasure and Tarnish. Uh, so Malaika and I were both artists in residence at Craft Alliance in 2018 and uh, we got the idea to collaborate on a show about a year ago and one of the really exciting crossover points of our collaboration is not only that we work in different media but that we have a shared interest in history and anthropology and literature and we landed on the fascinating topic of the 19th century archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann. He is colloquially known as the father of archaeology. And it took about a hundred years for people to realize, wait, he was not a good archaeologist. Yeah. He was a bad archaeologist. He was a con artist, a swindler. He made his fortune in an import-export business in St. Petersburg and then in the California Gold Rush. He got enough money to retire early, travel around the world, and then eventually land in Greece, where he decided he was going to dig up some ancient sites. Eventually, he set his sights on Troy and decided to prove that it existed. Um, he actually just went and took over some research that someone else was already there doing and decided that it was his own. One of the most significant artifacts that Heinrich Schliemann uncovered is Priam's treasure. And Heinrich decided that Priam, the king of Troy, this was his treasure and that Helen of Troy had worn it when he really had no reason to believe that that was true. And contemporary archaeologists believe that these artifacts that are part of the Priam's treasure collection was actually a collection that was from a few different sites within the Aegean world and crossed a time period of like 2,000 years. And so Schliemann is this figure who really actively and compellingly conflates history and fiction. So we wanted to sort of bring those two elements together in a way that sort of enveloped the viewer. So we start this gallery show in a space that is intended to feel like a contemporary anthropological exhibit. So you have these kind of clean displays. Um, Malaika made all of these ceramic replicas of things that would have been found in sites that Schliemann was excavating. Loom weights and spindle whorls, drinking vessels, cups, lots of fragments. Of course, back then, Schliemann was really only interested in the sparkly things. In contemporary archaeology, we're really fixated on tiny scraps of things. They tell us almost more than the large, beautiful, museum-worthy vessels. But back then, you just want the big, pretty things. So a lot of things were discarded. And then as you move through the gallery, we move out of that academic space into a personal, domestic space maybe of Schliemann's own kind of cabinet of curiosities. And what we were wanting to do was bring the viewer with Schliemann into Troy itself, into this sort of fantastical imagining of this space that he was so intent upon proving to be true. And then of course it becomes just full of lies. Yes, yes. Uh, fabrications and um, kind of these insertions of his own story. So in that spirit, Malaika and I have put in elements of our own narratives as artists and as women and collaborators, our own writing, our own memories. There's four main types of text you're gonna see a lot in the show. One is Heinrich Schliemann's journals, and he wrote in, what, 10 different languages. There's text that comes from a popular guidebook in the 1870s, which he basically copied word for word into his diaries. And you'll also see fragments of journals of mine, as well as some emails, <laughs> e-chats, and um, other things that were really fun to remove from the digital world into a physical space. 
My favorite thing about this show is how impressed we are with each other's work because we work in such different mediums and in such different ways that for me, I mean, every time we would show each other something we were working on, it would be like, how did you do that? So one of my greatest joys was taking Abby's drawings and being able to use several different surface decorative techniques to bring them to life in clay. And you'll see when you look around at some of her illustrations, they're just like mind-blowingly <laughs> detailed and intricate and gorgeous. So they transfer beautifully onto clay and I was really happy to work with them. Yeah, and I equally was hugely reliant on Malaika's deep well of knowledge about this time period and this area of study. Um, early on in our collaboration, she sent me two drawings of boats, one kind of European tall ship and one Trojan ship. And I used those drawings to create three-dimensional paper boat sculptures and then I made 110 of them. So there was just this really kind of joyful exchange of imagery and ideas. And I hope we will continue working together because it's been just like the best creative experience of my life. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. On average, every day across the globe, 150,000 people die. And more than 100,000 of them die from aging. I describe aging in the book as the world's greatest humanitarian challenge, and I really do believe that to be the case. The huge majority of human suffering is caused by aging. But science writer Andrew Steele believes it does not have to be that way. I really see research into aging as just a natural extension of the goals of modern medicine. We're trying to make people live healthier for longer. In Ageless, the new science of getting older without getting old, Steele offers a new way to think about aging not as an immutable fact of nature, but rather as the underlying cause of most fatal diseases. Arrest the aging process, the theory goes, and cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease could all become preventable. There's not gonna be a single pill you take that makes you live forever. I think that's what people imagine when you talk about a cure for aging, as I sometimes do. What it's gonna be is it's gonna be a whole variety of different treatments, different medicines, perhaps stem cells, perhaps gene therapy, all coming together to defer all of these different diseases in a variety of different ways. You talk in the book about things that we can do to, to live longer, uh, a whole list of things, one of them being a woman, but obviously that's not exactly Not so good for you and me. <laughs> uh, um, but, I, but I'm wondering how much time do any of these things, you know, exercise, eating, so forth, actually add to our lives uh, right now? There's a, what is it, the old quip about quitting smoking that, you know, you don't live longer, just feels longer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. all of these I, things combined, w w are we really buying that much more time if we live these great, healthy lives? I mean, quitting smoking is an absolute no-brainer. That is my top bit of health advice. It's like, if you want to live a long, healthy life, then quitting smoking should be the first item on your list. And the reason is you live about 10 years longer. And it's not just that it feels like longer. You live 10, year, 10 healthy years longer as well. So you live, you know, an extra decade on the end of your life. And an extra decade in good health. And actually what you find is the same thing with loads of other health advice. So things like eating well, not being overweight, um, trying to get some exercise. These slow down the aging process too, or, you know, pretty much. Um, and I think actually being overweight is a really good example. If you're carrying uh, extra fat, that fat can give out inflammatory molecules and it can drive a process called chronic inflammation. And that's known to drive all kinds of different age-related diseases, you know, heart disease, stroke, cancer, all of these things, or you know, not all cancers, I should say, some cancers. But nonetheless, you know, it drives this whole sort of swathe of age-related changes. And by losing a bit of weight, you can reduce that inflammatory burden on your body and basically slow down your aging. So I think um, that, that it's, it's actually made health advice a lot more compelling to me because you know you hear this stuff all the time that you you know make sure you get half an hour of exercise a day make sure you eat a variety of good things and you know don't don't, don't be too overweight but when you understand the biology behind them and that's what I try to explain in the book it just really you know it's really made me want to go out for a run a little bit more often than I did before is there a point though of no return or diminishing return say somebody is uh 60 years old uh overweight spends all day interviewing people <laughs> via <laughs> Skype. I'm asking for a friend, you understand. Is it too late or can you always try to reverse the aging process? You always can. And I think this is really remarkable. Um, there, I found some great studies where they had given 90-somethings an exercise uh, resistance training program, so strength training, basically. And they found that even people at that age could, that after a period of, a, I think it was a month or two, they could walk further, they could walk faster, they had you know, improved grip strength, which is a common, uh, commonly used as a measurement of aging. It's never too late to start. 
Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out why tortoises could unlock the mystery to a longer life. Or just head to HECmedia.org. HEC Media presents Talking with Authors, the podcast. Your favorite writers and genres with diverse subjects and styles, like Jenna Fisher with The Actor's Life, A Survival Guide. The book is literally about my journey from St. Louis to Hollywood. With new podcasts dropping bi-weekly, subscribe to Talking with Authors. Charles Darwin once said, the love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of man. And while it's easy for most people to love these beautiful creatures, their next door neighbors at the Butterfly House in St. Louis usually elicit a different emotion. They freaked me out. <laughs> yep, that's the reaction most people have to cockroaches. Just because when I lived in the South, they were always, they were in my garage. Mary Schloss has since moved to New York, but she carried that cockroach contempt with her. That is, until her best friend Andrea gifted her a certain video dedication. Mary, allow us to introduce you to one of our residents. This is an orange head roach from Central America. And as Andrea requested on your behalf, we have named this particular roach Waylon. And it was my ex-husband's name given to a cockroach. And I literally, like, bent down because I was laughing so hard. Besides cracking her up, the video had another somewhat surprising effect. I like this one. So what was it in your video that changed your mind a little bit about cockroaches? Do you remember? Actually, the information, how, like, they take care of each other. When he finds a particularly juicy slice of orange or apple, he doesn't hoard it for himself. He makes sure others get to share in the bounty. And they provide for each other and for the environment, so. Mission accomplished for Butterfly House entomologist Chris Hartley. Absolutely, I think they get a bad rap. They are used as the icky bug way too often who works with a team to make these cockroach dedications. But we at the Butterfly House try to encourage every person on our planet, really, to at least think of them as being important to the planet. They're decomposers, they enrich the soil, they get rid of trash, by which I mean fallen leaves and rotting wood and things like that. And that's a crucial function for our environment that we really can't survive without. As nature's trashmen, of the more than 4,000 species of cockroach on the planet, most of them want to be outside. So like our friends, the orange head cockroaches over here, even in Central America where they're native, they don't move into people's houses. That's just not what they're looking to do. While we're breaking down roach rumors, here are a few more. Cockroaches could live through a nuclear explosion. No, they could not survive the, the detonation of a nuclear weapon, no. But they do have more resistance to the radiation that would be lingering afterwards than the human does. Cockroaches can attack humans. They don't have a stinger, they don't have any chemicals, like they can't squirt acid in my hand or anything crazy like that. Cockroaches have been around since the time of dinosaurs. Well, that one's fiction because they've been around longer than that. They were on this earth before the dinosaurs came to be. For hundreds of millions of years, they've been around doing what modern day roaches do, which is decomposing things and cleaning up the environment. And they've pretty much, you'd recognize it as a cockroach. It looks like today's cockroaches. Here's something else that's kind of crazy. They breathe through holes on the side of their body called spiracles. But the spiracles are these holes right here. Every segment of the body has a pair of them. So even if the head was gone, they could still take in air. You heard right. A cockroach can live for several days without its head. Also, even though it's an insect, it gives birth, sort of. So cockroaches have eggs, just like all insects do. However, the hissing cockroach and the orange head cockroaches and certain others grow the eggs inside their bodies. So live babies are eventually born when the mother gives birth. So it very much looks like she has live birth. Biologically, they're eggs that hatched inside the mom and she just gave birth. It's called ovovivipary, if you want to add a science word. 
Finally, cockroaches are actually neat freaks. In fact, anytime they've been through a dirty place, they stop and they actually wash their hands for their feet. They wash their antennae. They clean themselves very thoroughly. So if you handle a cockroach and spend a long time with it in your hand, when you put it down, it will immediately clean itself to get the human smell off. Watch them bathe themselves, which is super cute. Uh, cute? I think the thing that is my favorite about cockroaches are to know that some are very pretty. Pretty? That's not exactly how Mary or most people would describe a cockroach. There's my cockroach! You did get big! You look bigger! But thanks to her new friend Waylon the cockroach, she does have a newfound respect for the insect. It was the best gift. Powerhouse vocalist Miss Jubilee later on Spotlight. On the corner of Duncan and Newstead Avenues, there's been tremendous activity on the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis campus for many months. The more than $600 million building project will span almost a block on the edge of the Cortex Innovation Community, one of the fastest growing business, innovation, and technology hubs in the United States. Far-reaching benefits of this labor are certain. Once every piece of the medical school's largest building project ever is in place and the structure's doors open, the work that lies ahead will help Alzheimer's patients and families suffering through the devastating disease. It will help the investigation and treatment of deadly brain tumors, the development of innovative pain management therapies, new therapies for severe mental illness, and much more. We actually have global excellence in neuroscience research, but we haven't had any sort of coordinating um, factor. One step at a time, but before long, the 11-story building will bring together over 100 research teams focused on solving the many mysteries of the brain and the body's nervous system. This will become the Neuroscience Research Building and we're designing this to have neighborhoods of researchers. So rather than each researcher having their own individual laboratory area, we actually have multiple researchers sharing the same space. Dr. Jennifer Lodge is the Senior Associate Dean for Research and the Vice Chancellor for Research. She's part of the Executive Committee planning the new building, an important step to bringing many labs on campus committed to neuroscience together in one place. So we'll bring together people from multiple departments and disciplines together around a theme rather than their departmental affiliation. What's exciting about the Neuroscience Research Building is that it's a theme-based building. So it's the first building that the School of Medicine has built that is not based on any one science. It's focused on building a state-of-art neuroscience facility that has multiple themes, multiple focuses. And those themes include neurodegeneration, uh, genetics, psychiatry, anesthesiology, um, we have a model systems group, and so it's meant to take all, all scientists and study of neuroscience and bring them together for collaboration and innovation. Understanding the brain is key to addressing many devastating afflictions. As Assistant Vice Chancellor of Operations for the School of Medicine, Melissa Hopkins explains how her team methodically designed a space that can help. There's four neighborhoods per floor, so the themes are about the researchers that sit within those neighborhoods. And the way people have been placed in the building is they are placed by like or complementary research within those themes to enable more collaboration. Professor Dr. David Holtzman is head of the Department of Neurology. In the neuroscience community is the, is the plethora of neuroscience research going on to better understand neurodegenerative diseases. Those include Alzheimer's disease, ALS, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease. Um, aspects of certainly multiple sclerosis. Um, so the, there's a lot of new uh, knowledge being gained and we have probably uh, a larger community here of outstanding people than virtually anywhere else in the world. Having said that, right now we're not all in the same location and I think bringing some of those people even closer together will greatly add to some of the findings. For example, research in this School of Medicine lab is focused on the study of the sleep-wake cycle, 
regulated by the circadian clock. A recent discovery here may offer a potential new drug target for treating Alzheimer's disease. The layout of the new building will increase this type of collaboration and success. A lot of times new ideas come forth because of interactions that do need to occur in person. Being on the eastern edge of campus, the building is next to the Cortex Innovation District, offering inspiration for health-focused commercial applications and business development for successful research. Once construction is completed, labs will move into the building in 2023, creating space and possibilities throughout other areas of campus. Enable other research at our institution to grow. We have excellence in infectious disease and immunology, which is critically important uh, during this pandemic. We have expertise in cancer, and it's going to enable additional space for those programs to grow. And we are hoping at some point that we will have a naming gift so that we can have a more official name for the building. at the Sheldon Art Galleries and we have seven new exhibits for spring that will be open through May 15th. My new position at the Sheldon Art Galleries is gallery manager so I curate the exhibits for the galleries and I want the galleries to go in the direction of focusing on local and regional artists and young and upcoming artists as well. I think it's very important to promote what we have around us. The exhibits we have in the spring really highlight the local artists and regional with people from Lexington, Kentucky and Urbana, Illinois. In the Bellwether Gallery, we have landscape paintings by Wallace Herndon Smith from the collection of the Bellwether Foundation. Featured are oil paintings, watercolors, and for the first time on view, drawings from Wallace's sketchbooks that date from the 1930s through the 1950s. Wallace Herndon Smith was born in St. Louis, went to Washington University in the architecture program, and lived a good portion of his later life here in St. Louis. He uh, founded the Bellwether Foundation, and now they currently hold the collection of his paintings. The gallery of photography, we have two artists. In the first section, we have printmaker Gwen Montgomery. She's a printmaker, sculptor, and performance artist. Gwen's work focuses on what objects we focus on. So what do we collect, what do we hoard and covet, and how these objects tell our stories. We have on view sculptures from irons that she has etched into. She calls it her domestic series, injuries from domestic life, and they're beautiful, beautiful etchings. In the second section of the gallery of photography, we have James Southard from Lexington, Kentucky. The exhibit he has featured for us is a series titled, Why Buy the Cow? James spent three years following, documenting, and interviewing small operation dairy farmers in Vermont. And the one story that came through was that large scale dairy farms operations took over and the small farms disappeared. So James focused on one family for two years and documented their farm and their family life. In the Gallery of Architecture, we have work by Stephanie Jacobson Kirkland, who is the Deputy Director at Craft Alliance here in St. Louis. Stephanie's exhibit focuses on dynamic collages of cityscapes that examine the cities she lived in in the past and her collected memories and how they have defined who she is today. They're very colorful and very strong, and it kind of shows Stephanie's personality, and they're basically self-portraits of Stephanie. In the Children's Gallery, we have a strong body of work from St. Louis Community College at Merrimack. The students completed recently a body of work for the exhibit from the Department of Design, Visual, and Performing Arts. It's important at a young age to be able to show your work. It gives you encouragement to pursue a career in art. And in the Gallery of Music, we have an ongoing installation of instruments from Asia and Oceania from the Hartenberger World Music Collection. There are some incredible instruments from China, Japan, Korea, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, Australia, and many other countries. And in the Cranesburg Gallery downstairs, we have local artist Tim Hahn. Tim's large body of work for the exhibit was completed during the pandemic. They're beautiful sculptural paintings 
created from wood, acrylic, and subtle drawing details. There is a great relationship between color, form, and material within the paintings that work well with one another. The Sheldon's mission here in St. Louis is to promote young artists and local and regional artists and to keep a spotlight on them. We're open five days a week. Reservations are required and you can get more information on our website, thesheldon.org. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Next week, world-class storytellers and the free virtual event you're invited to, plus a fearless team of brothers and the sport that changed their lives. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.